So let's begin. Thank you so much for being here, first of all. And uh, we'll start with a word of prayer. So who wants to pray for us? Dearest Jesus, Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together in this room this morning to learn more about you and how we can bring you glory by sharing your word with those around us. We pray that you would um, bless this time of discussion and enlighten us through your word and, and dive deeper into your word. Be with Dan as he shares his knowledge wisdom that you have bestowed upon him with us. And, um, Send us away with something new this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, we have uh, an ambitious goal today, and this is what I'm going to try for us to cover. And what's the gospel, what's not the gospel, some keys to evangelism, asking questions and listening, and then developing um, your own grace story and sharing it effectively. So we have a lot to cover, hopefully um, we'll get through it. If you were here uh, last time, you um, already learned that I'm a big um, Tim Keller fan. And um, one time he was, uh, well I'm sure more than one time, but he was presenting, as he did often in, a, in, a, in college campuses. And this is um, a video of a question and answer time that he had at UPenn. And um, I thought that that would be really how far to get us started. What does it take to be a Shenmue dancer? It takes a mind. Here we go. What else does it take? <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's try it all over again. University of Pennsylvania all the time, and uh, very often they're over in front of the library, uh, literally standing on soapboxes. Well, actually, the kind of plastic cans, yeah. but anyway. Um, and they tell us that abortion is murder, and that we're all going to hell because we're fornicating. And they get very perturbed when I tell them, but that's not preaching the gospel. Uh, what you said tonight is very significant, but I think that you can include uh, in, as we nearly close, what is the gospel? Tell us the gospel. Would you like me to talk to these people? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, because sometimes well, they can't answer that question. Yeah, yeah um, the, um, you, you know, when I, at, at, near the end of the, it's the book of Jude, which is near the end of the, the Bible. <laughs> Some of you didn't even know there was a book of Jude. It's right before Revel. It's right before his more famous uh, uh, friend, the book of Revelation. Uh, and there's a place, Jude is writing to a church. And one of the things that always amazes me there is uh, there's a command of the church that says, be merciful to them that doubt. Be merciful to them that doubt. Uh, or uh, here's another place where Jesus uh, uh, meets a guy who comes along and says, Help my, uh, uh, heal my son. This is Mark chapter 9. And Jesus says, I can do it if you believe. And he says, I believe, help my unbelief, which is a great way of saying, I really, I'm trying to believe, but I'm filled with doubts. Jesus does not say, well, come back when you've dealt with those, and then I'll heal your son. You know, the standard is you've got to believe. You've got you've got to give yourself to me wholly without any doubts. And it's amazing. You know, he says, help my son. She says, I can if you believe. Well, I'm trying to believe. I really, I fill with doubts. And Jesus heals his son. Uh, he's merciful to a man who's doubting, who's trying. Now, I, I can tell you this. That this is what I mean when I meant, uh, I, I'll use, I will tell you what I think the gospel is by the branch. Uh, there's a, remember that branch illustration? If Jesus Christ's death and resurrection in my place, if I, I believe that, uh, then I don't. I don't have to be a good person. I don't have to have great faith. I don't have to have this surrendered heart. I don't have to have this perfect life. I just need to grab that branch and I'm saved. And uh, on the other hand, uh, a person who is got no doubts and I know I'm living a good life and I'm 
I'm, uh, I'm not fornicating, and I'm not having abortions, and I'm not, uh, uh, and I'm obeying the Ten Commandments, and you're filled with pride, and you therefore are not merciful to those who doubt. You look at people who doubt and say, why can't you be like me? This is a person who's, who's all fallen off the cliff. They're filled with belief about the Bible and doctrine, but they actually haven't relied on Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're being their own Savior. So Christianity says, the, 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 Christianity says religion, traditional religion, which produces Pharisees, is I give God a good record, and then in response to that, he blesses me. But Christianity is, God gives me a perfect record in Jesus Christ as a free gift. I'm a sinner, and I only get it when I admit that I'm a moral failure. And then he gives me this acceptance, and now I live for him out of gratitude, which means a lack of that. If I'm a sinner saved by grace, there has to be a, a lack of the superiority and the self-righteousness that you see in the people in the soapboxes. Mm -hmm. A man across my hallway, where I've lived for 19 years, my neighbor is a Hindu. And I look at him, and as far as I can tell, he's, he, he probably is a more moral man than me. He, he may be a better man than me, if he even thought of broadly. He's, he's certainly a better father than me. And you say, well, how can you say, don't you believe you're saved? You're a Christian, he's a Hindu. The answer is, I'm not saved by being a good father or by being a good man. I'm saved by the mercy of Jesus Christ, of what he's done. And therefore, I can't feel superior to him. There's a tendency, because my heart is sinful and self-centered, a tendency to use my Christianity to feel like, why don't you give up the truth? But the gospel takes me out of it. But people, I think people like the people you're talking about, don't understand that gospel. The self-righteousness, the Phariseeism, is something that the gospel should expunge. And so if you're out here thinking about Christianity and you're thinking about people like that, keep in mind that Christianity has, uh, that's not Christianity. And it also has self-corrective resources within it. it. That's why you have the Old Testament prophets railing against religion. You have Jesus railing against the Pharisees to say you don't understand grace. So I hope that helps a bit. Okay? Over here. Drinking coffee every day didn't work for me, but I couldn't figure out why until I went from 184 to 123. I hope, I hope what you remember from this class is not that. <laughs> but um, I like the video I showed with you of Tim Keller, not just because of his um, excellent way of, um, of explaining what the gospel is, but also um, of his own understanding of the audience that he communicates with. And um, we'll talk a lot more about it later on today and, and also in, in the coming weeks. Um, but he's just, uh, he just does a masterful job in, um, in knowing the audience that he um, is communicating to. So what is the gospel? Of course, gospel um, is good news and um, based on bad news. You all know that the bad news are not just the fact that we're all sinners and we all fall short, but also the fact, like Tim communicated, there's nothing, absolutely nothing, that you and I can do to change that or to help us. And sinners are saved by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. And I don't know how much you guys are aware of the five solas. These are three of them. I don't want to get into it, that's more of a theology thing, but I found this great article on the Gospel Coalition, which I printed for you guys. You can read about it, and there's also more, more resources here, but um, I thought I would just give it out. And when you get the, the PowerPoint, you can also just look at the, um, at the link, um, and you can also read that. But when we think about the gospel, we should always um, think about scripture. We are a Bible church, um, as it should be. And since we're in 1 Corinthians, I thought that um, I, obviously there are many other scriptures that we could use. But here is uh, what is the gospel based on what Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. And so I'll read to us, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 10. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, 
which you received, in which you stand, and by which you're being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, and according with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. <clears throat> Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Paul here obviously gives us the knowledge and information of the good news of the gospel. Jesus coming, dying for us, rising on the third day. But note how Paul also, not fully, we have a fuller um, description in the book of Acts especially of Paul's grace story, his testimony. But notice how concisely he does mentioning it, mention it in our verses, tying it to grace, which is of course um, a pillar of the gospel, right? And at the end, very intentionally, talking about why is he the least of the apostles? Why is he so undeserving based on Paul more than any of us? Because he persecuted the church, right? Right? But by grace. So that's uh, also a great example for us as we um, think about um, our own grace story. Moving from what's the gospel to what's not the gospel, I found um, this really badly drawn diagram on this uh, whiteboard. Yes, I did it. And it is a way, is a way of kind of explaining things that's very helpful for me. So most people, this is the way they view religion, faith, I mean, in a very simplistic way, right? We're on the bottom, God is on the top. And even atheists and agnostics would think that that's the way that basically it works. That's why they say, hey, at the end of it, all religions, all faiths are the same. It's just a little bit different, right? So if you look at Muslims, right? The Muslim is down here, God is on top. How do I get to the top? How do I get to God? Well, I'm not an expert in world religions, certainly not Islam. Um, but, you know, a typical Muslim might say, well, through Muhammad, through his teaching, through the Quran, right? And I'm a lot more familiar with Judaism, as you could imagine. And the average Jewish person would say, yeah, it's through the commandments of Moses, or through the commandments of the rabbis. That's how we get to God. And, of course, Buddhism, it'll be through Buddha. I really quickly try to impress you, so I... And Googled how is it that Hindus say they get to God, and I got all these words that I <laughs> can't really pronounce well, but karma and raja, and you know, they've got four ways that they go up. And the and, uh, unbeliever would say in Christianity, you guys are all the same, only for you guys, it's not these guys, it's just through Jesus, you know. And so many. Um, brothers and sisters, so many Christians I find, say, yeah, that's exactly it. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And only through him we can get to the Father, which is, of course, correct. But that's really not what our faith is about, right? Our faith is actually this. <clears throat> there is no way that we can ever get up to God. There is no way that we could ever be holy enough for God. And that's why Jesus, God in the flesh, came down to us. Right? 
So that small difference is huge. It's huge for us and for the gospel, right? The fact that none of us could ever make it, which is exactly why God had to come and in the flesh and to rescue us, to show mercy to us, and, and so on. Any comments? Or so therefore, what's not the gospel? <clears throat> Our convictions, and we heard Tim, and the question was, you know, these guys who are on campus, college campus, and talking about their, you know, a right conviction that uh, um, that abortion is wrong and so on. You saw the video, um, but our convictions are not the gospel. If it's theological or political, if it's right or wrong, and um, our morality, rules, and regulations, that's not the gospel. Not even the Ten Commandments, and um, even our own grace story, is not the gospel. Now. It may contain the gospel, but my own experience with God, um, which is really at the heart of our grace story, right, is not the gospel. Um, same thing with uh, Peter's or Steve's sermons. They may have the gospel in them, but somebody coming to church and hearing um, sermons is not what's going to um, save them, right? It's not what's going to make them right. And it really is only the gospel that does all of that. And this is really important for us in our evangelism. When we practice evangelism, and we have to remember that. And obviously, and when you practice evangelism, we would want you to share the gospel. And even if it's not the whole gospel fully, but maybe one aspect of it that's fitting the person that you are um, communicating with. Okay. Any questions or comments before I move on? Obviously, there's a lot that could be said about this. I was trying to be really concise. Anything else? Okay. So, key to evangelism. When we think about evangelism, um, I like to make things simple, okay? So I have the three P's for evangelism. And first and foremost, um, we need to start with prayer. Why is prayer so important? Well, when somebody comes to believe in Jesus, when somebody accepts the gospel, um, it's nothing great that you or I did um, it's never our work, it's always God's work. And therefore, praying has to be a part of our evangelism. And um, it was said before, I don't know by who, but somebody said, I remember reading it, that the key to evangelism is prayer. Um, it's really the most effective um, weapon that we have in our arsenal. Okay? Um, a scriptural examples of prayer in evangelism. Well, Apostle Paul in Romans 10, 1 and 2, he says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, he was talking about the Jewish people, is that they may be saved. He's praying for them so that they will be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So we find Apostle Paul praying for Israel, for the Jewish people, for their salvation. And we should do that often with people, with especially with the people that God has placed um, in our own hearts. I love Colossians chapter 4, um, verses 2 to 4. Again, the Apostle Paul says, Continue steadfastly in doing in sharing the gospel now, he says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear 
which is how I ought to speak. Here's an example where Paul, where Paul asks for prayer for himself. And I think that that's something that maybe sometimes um, we don't do enough of. Asking others to pray for us as we share the gospel. And you praying for yourself as you share the gospel. Here Paul is asking for open doors, for um, clear communications, for a receptive heart. And prayer is key to evangelism. Okay? The next thing um, is people, okay? And of course, that's connected to prayer. And I want to talk about two different people in this, um, in this P. And the first one is us, me and you. As, um, as disciples, that's one of our mandates, to go and make disciples. I think we talked about it last time, right? So God, for whatever reason, I don't really understand. I'm, I'm not God. I don't know why he chooses to use people, broken vessels like us, but he does, okay? So we are important in the task of really world evangelization. God uses people. He doesn't just want to use pastors or missionaries or those who are in full-time ministry. And actually, a key to world evangelization is for the whole church to take up the mantle and the call of being missionaries, <coughs> of going out there and sharing the gospel. That's why we're offering this class. That's why one of our core values at GRC is to make disciples, okay? Because we all need to do it. Every single disciple of Messiah of Christ must share the gospel, must practice evangelism, okay? So that's first. And second people, obviously, are the people that we share with. All of you here, I am 100% sure, has some people in your life that God has placed strategically that you are entrusted to, to bring the gospel to. That's why they're in your life, okay? And you need to start, we need to start thinking about them in this way and to think about them strategically. One um, practice that I have that may be helpful to you is to create a top 10 list. What is a top 10 list? It's a very practical, easy thing to do. You take a piece of paper, I even have some for you if you want to use one of my pads or you can get a little bit more fancy. And you write on this piece of paper the top 10 people that are in your life that you would like to see come to faith in Christ, okay? Then you take this piece of paper and you put it in your Bible, or maybe you hang it on your refrigerator, whichever one you open more often. <laughs> <laughs> yes, probably your Bible is better. See you guys like that, good. Um, and then you go to our first P and start praying for these people, okay? And as I've practiced this throughout my, my, um, my life and my journey with Christ, it's just so amazing how you start crossing off people off that list, you know, as you pray for them, as you intercede, as you um, are moved to share with them. And it's just a really practical way of being really strategic with those people that are in your life that you are building relationships with and that you are um, sharing the gospel. So I want to encourage you to do that. And, you know, this class is very practical because we want you to actually go out and practice. <laughs> so, um, so that's one uh, tip. And then the um, last thing I would say is perseverance. Don't ever give up. Um, I know for me it's always very difficult. 
especially. Um, I'll share with you my top ten list. It includes my family. Um, by the way, none of which have come to faith yet. So my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister-in-law, nieces, aunts and uncles, cousins, I can give you all their names. But the point is, is that our timing is not God's time, right? And then regardless of the results, which is not our um, work anyway, you know, we need to persevere. And we need to continue to pray and continue to share. First uh, Timothy. Somebody has it. You can read it. First Timothy 1, 15 and 16. Thank you. Here is, a <clears throat> Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Yeah. So, here again, Paul, talking about him being the chiefest of sinners. And remember Paul's testimony, I know you're all aware of it, how he was the one who was uh, there probably planning, definitely watching the clothes of those who were, um, who were martyring Stephen, the first church martyr, remember in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 7 and 8, and how Paul came to faith, you know, and I'm sure that the early church was praying a lot for this monster Paul who was persecuting them, right? Don't you think they were probably fasting and praying for him and just, of course, praying God's mercy and that maybe they won't be caught in, as, as followers of, of Messiah, but also just praying for him and his salvation. And I'm sure at times it looked like it could never happen. And I'm sure that they were discouraged and frustrated, but they persevered. And um, look what happened. And Paul, of course, came to faith in, in Messiah, Jesus. Are there any questions before we continue with evangelism? Okay. Very good. So, a key to evangelism, um, as hopefully you have figured out from me recommending this book to you, is asking questions and listening. And I don't know if you got the book, if you started reading it or not, but I, am, I think that this book is really um, the best out there when it comes to kind of giving us some practical tips and how to of evangelism. And uh, I want to read to you from page 28 and 29, um, basically kind of the premise for this book, okay? This is what Randy Newman, the author, says. It says, um, the title, the subtitle here is, there, is there a better way to evangelize? It says, it involves more than listening. It involves more listening than speaking, inviting rather than demanding a decision. Perhaps the most competent to this kind of evangelism is answering questions with questions rather than giving answers. Maybe I think this way, responding to questions with questions, because I'm Jewish. I grew up with dialogues that went like this. Randy, what's the weather down there? Granny Bell. How could the weather be in Florida in the middle of July? <laughs> or Randy. So how have you been? Uncle Nat. What do you, why do you ask? Or Randy, how's your family? Aunt Vivian. Compared to whom? <laughs> I would like to think, though, that I answer questions with questions because I'm following the example of Jesus. It's uncanny how often our Lord answered the question with a question. A rich man asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
the question was a great setup for a clear, concise gospel presentation. I can almost hear a disciple whispering in Jesus' ear, take out the booklet. <laughs> How could Jesus not launch into the most perfect model for every evangelistic training seminar for all time. But how did he respond? He posed a question. Why do you call me, why do you call me good? That's based out of Mark 10, verses 17 and 18. When religious leaders asked Jesus if it was right to pay taxes, Jesus referred to a coin and asked, whose image is this? When the Pharisees, looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus' response was a question. If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? I once did a study of how Jesus answered every question that was asked of him in all four Gospels. Answering a question with a question was the norm. A clear, concise, direct answer was a rarity. So when I answer a question with a question, I would like to think I'm following the example of Jesus. But to be honest, I most likely do it because I become tired. After years of answering the questions of non-believers, I grow tired of my answers being rejected. At times, far too often I'm afraid, I have answered questions with biblically accurate, logically sound, epistemologically water right answers, only to see questions shrug their sh questioners shrug their shoulders. My answers, it seemed, only further confirmed their opinion that Christians are simpletons. My answers had, in fact, hardened them in their unbelief rather than soften them towards faith. I realize that instead of moving people closer to a salvation decision, an answer can push them further away. Rather than engaging their minds or urging them to consider an alternate perspective, an answer can give them ammunition for future attacks against the gospel. So I started answering questions with questions and have gained far better results. Mm -hmm. That's my experience as well. You know, my and gospel sharing. Asking questions. I think that when we ask questions of people, it shows them that we love them, that we care for them, that we're, interest, that we're interested in them. And many times we just want to jump to the apologetics of how do I defend the faith and what's the right answer to where was God when the six million people died in the Holocaust or when the towers fell in Manhattan or how can you find the Bible to be reliable, you know, and how is it truth or we get all these questions and we are so, we are so tempted to just go on and answer those questions with our own knowledge and with truth where many times it's far better to ask questions back and to answer questions with questions so um, I think that that would be something that I would encourage in all of you to do as you go out there and share the gospel you know as you interact with people as you love people, and when they ask you a question, try to think what you could ask back. And many times asking question is just a question of knowing them and caring about them and knowing your audience. Knowing your audience, the person that you are sharing with, is extremely important because only when you know them and will you be able to bring the gospel to them in a way that would be relevant and applicable um, to their own life? Um, we'll talk more about that, but um, I want to um, I want to mention that really a lot of our evangelism has to be asking questions, and equally important after that, actually listening, mm -hmm. listening to their responses 
And only when you know your audience can you bring the gospel in a relevant way to his or her life. The founder of um, Jews for Jesus, Moish Rosen, um, made it a point to, uh, to have all of our missionaries who are in training um, understand that the most important skill for a missionary is the skill of listening. Okay, far too often we don't listen well. And I don't know how many times I've seen people who kind of interact with unbelievers and they are, you know, looking on their phone and, and texting while somebody else is speaking. I'm the chiefest of sinners. I've done this a million times, trust me. But that's not, not the right way. We need to listen. We need to focus on the person that, um, that God has placed in our, in our life that, um, that, that we are to um, be a light to and share the gospel. So, um, ask questions, listen, learn um, the person that you are sharing with. It's not, um, it's helpful, and I would say that that's another tip, something that I do. I actually um, take notes on people that um, I know that are in my life and that I run into often. Neighbors, and you know, people that, that I see maybe at the gym, which I haven't been to in a very long time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, and so on. You know, taking notes on people is actually wise. And for me, that's how I remember, by writing. And you may have your own way. But, you know, remember people and remember people's struggles. And, and, and things that they are and having in their own life, taking notes, and then um, you know asking them questions about it. How is it going? Sometimes even mentioning that you're praying for them for this particular thing that maybe they shared with you um, is just um, really, really helpful and valuable, and will give you more opportunities to um, to share the gospel. Any questions or comments? I think this just highlights our human tendency to want results, <laughs> to want a formula. Um, and yeah, I think it just goes against our um, inability to have patience. You know, and many times we think that the process of discipleship starts when somebody comes to faith in Jesus, but that's not true. Making disciples you know, is really walking with people and sharing with them and sharing the gospel over and over and over again. And living a life and you know, praying for them, persevering with them. Yeah, being patient. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, it does go against our human nature. Maybe even more in this culture where Gen Z and maybe millennials as well just want things quick and right away and you know, give me the two minute video, the you know, thirty second summary of
that the seed planted by one believer sharing the gospel may not be the water that continues to be poured on it, and and so it's not the work of um, God through one person to bring someone to faith, but rather the work of God through so many different people. Um, and I, I forget that often and become frustrated for the same reasons, Claire, that you mentioned. But. Yeah, we don't have a full picture of the parade. Right, of somebody's life journey, right? We just see, you know, you stand, I know how many of you have been to the Thanksgiving Day Parade. I've been already twice, three times. I know, I know. You're thinking, wow, you're crazy. <laughs> I love it, I don't know why. But anyway, I think it's such a good picture because I just see, you know, one part of it. You know, I don't see the full thing. I don't know what's coming, um, what's coming ahead, what went before, I don't see the whole thing, I don't know what the prep that's happened, all the different people that are there, and we just have such a small point of view of somebody's life. But God, right? Mm -hmm. God knows everything. He sees it all. For him, it's not, you know, he's, he, he exists beyond time. You know, he knows the beginning, he knows the end, he knows everything in between. We're just a little... You just have a sliver of uh, perspective. <coughs> yeah. Very cool. When uh, Dina and I, when, when our family, when we moved to, um, to New Jersey, um, we came from Israel, as you all know, and um, we came from, uh, um, we, we were leading a congregation, a church in Israel. And um, one of the things that I regret so badly that we didn't do in Israel in our church, that I love that we do here at GRC, is hearing each other's grace stories. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I don't, obviously I don't know, I know some churches, I don't know all the churches who <laughs> does, but I don't know of any church that does that. And then on a Sunday morning, regularly, mm -hmm. and Twice a year, three weeks each time, we give people opportunities to stand up and share their grace. I mean, that's really, really incredible. That's one of the many, many things that we love in, about our, our home church. And I think that grace story is not just something that we should um, share um, in front of the congregation. Um, I mean, certainly it's incredible. And it's not just something that you should only have and share um, if, you know, Peter or Steve um, ask you to do so, okay? Um, it's something that we should all, every single one of us, um, should have. We all have it, but we should all be able to share it. Now, if you shared your grace story here at church, you know, I did it in April of 2021, I think. And you know that Peter doesn't just say to you, hey, come on a Sunday morning and just uh, stand up there and share your testimony of how you came to faith in Jesus. It doesn't work that way. Okay? If you're going to go, and if Peter or Steve or somebody is going to ask you to come on Sunday morning and share a grace story, they're going to say to you, hey, you first have to actually write it down. Okay? They make you write it down, and then you send it to Peter, and then... Um, I don't know if it's everybody's experience, but sometimes you get them, you get it back with some questions or with some comments or with some requests. Okay, I won't tell you how many times I have to go back and forth with Peter. We'll keep that between the two of us. But writing your um, grace story is just something wise that I think every single GRCer should have and should do, regardless of if you're asked to share it on a Sunday morning or not, okay? The reason is, is because when your relationship matures with an individual and when it's appropriate, I think that sharing your grace story is a powerful tool that God can use in taking your evangelism to the next level with and the person that you're sharing with. And it really um, allows for you to share what God has done for you, what God has done in your life. 
him. Now, you're not gonna maybe on the first time show somebody your whole Grace story, um, but um, you know, you might be able to share some relevance part of it, okay? Part of the art of sharing your Grace story with an individual is knowing what parts to share when, dependent on the person's um, on, on the person's own life and questions and, and, and so on, okay? But to start off, you should work on writing your own grace story. Um, the full thing, from start to finish, and um, I want to encourage each of us to do that, okay? So here are some pointers, okay? First of all, when you share your grace story, try not to use Christianese. Okay. What is Christianese? Christianese are Christian words that we use so much as part of our own vocabulary um, that we don't realize that the average New Jerseyan unbeliever doesn't really know what we're talking about. Okay? Words like salvation. Words like atonement. Um, of course, there are more fancy um, words like this article I gave you, the five solas. You know, I don't think and many unbelievers would know what are we talking about, right? And when you share with unbelievers, it's important for you to know um, your audience and to use everyday language that they can understand. So as you think about it, as you write, your um, grace story, think about those words and don't use words that are Christianese, okay? Um, knowing your audience is really important um, when, when you share your grace story, and I already touched that, about that. And of course, we want you to never forget the gospel um, or Jesus. And if you have a whole grace story and you don't mention Jesus, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and we definitely want to use scripture as well, okay? So you'll see in the homework slide that that's one of the homeworks that um, I'm going to ask that we all do, and that is to work on our own grace story. And when you have it ready, and as it's there and as you're working on it, I believe that God's going to give you an opportunity to share that story with those that he strategically has placed in your life um, that he's calling you to share with. Okay. So, just to close, we have five minutes. I want to show you another commercial, sorry, another video. <laughs> um, but there will be a commercial here, and hopefully, um, hopefully you'll enjoy this one. Good ev evangelism involves more than just words and good intentions. Knock out some devos real quick. Spend some time with Jesus. I woke up kind of late this morning. Yeah, come on, let's go. Over. Let's go. Over. Let me sit down. I just want to share something from God's word. He hit me up in my devos this morning, and I was like, I gotta share this. Genesis 1 1. Thirsty, huh? Get some water. Yeah, I need the living water. I was noticing that you're drawing some stuff over here. Back before when I wasn't a Christian, I, I was making so much money as a graphic designer. You've been born again? You've been born again? Again. And you need to go walking in the flesh. I mean, obviously you don't really know God your tattoos and you know your ear and stuff. Can you start out the <laughs> You're not realizing that there is a God. He sent Jesus to die for you. Why did you see that? And in chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, I just would go to these crazy parties. It was crazy. Well, I mean, just cash like crazy, but uh, but I've left all that behind. Now I'm a Christian. You can't live life without God. He's not real. He's here. I can't yes, see him. I'm just not getting dirty. God is real. Touch him. Yeah, you can't touch Africa, but Africa exists. I <laughs> Too blessed to be stressed by the devil's mess. What's holding you back from committing your life to Jesus Christ? 
Uh, it's probably the sin in your life is what's going on. <laughs> scared? Hella scared. <laughs> if not today, if not tomorrow, she's going to die. If you're going to die, what do you think you will do? Well, that sounded hot. I wonder how hot hell is. Hopefully you don't go there. Oh, this is good. The New Testament is so just applicable. Have you guys noticed this? Hey, you could be washed by the blood of the Lamb. I mean, so that you are justified, sanctified, future glorified. I and mean, this is amazing. you got to come out. Do you drive a Volkswagen? Yeah, yeah, I do. But regardless, man, you got to come to church. Hey, do you remember what I said? Hell? Scary. Yay. <laughs> Hopefully you got the point. <laughs> so, here you go, homework. Stevie's gonna check up on you. <laughs> but here are some uh, suggested things, practical things. Compile your top ten list. Pray for these people's salvation. Write your great story. And then practice evangelism. And the last and next week, and then we've got two more lectures in this class. And the last two, we're going to focus more on the apologetic side. Okay? So this was more the evangelism side, practicing evangelism. We're going to talk about some apologetics in the last two lectures. Okay? Any final questions or comments? We kind of have to close. So you don't approve uh, handing out tracts on the streets? So that's the methodology that Jews for Jesus used for, um, I don't know, 40, 45 years. I've handed out tracks in Brooklyn, New York City, in subways. More tracks than you care to know. And just in this area, not to mention Israel and in other places. So it's not that I don't approve of it. And who cares about what I approve of? You know? mm -hmm. what, what does that matter? You should follow your convictions, you know, absolutely. But I can tell you from my own experience that they're just, it's not an effective way of sharing the gospel. In fact, in Jews for Jesus, we have found that it's actually a deterrent. And actually, people and are not, and they, they actually avoid you. And we don't want our methodology to be something that um, helps people avoid the gospel and help people to say, oh, well, these guys are nuts, we don't want to have anything to do with them. You know what I mean? So that's why, I, that's not a way that I share the gospel. But, you know, that's just my own convictions and experience. And I don't want to be the one who, who judges and, you know, you need to do whatever you feel is most appropriate in your own context. Could be location society specific. In this area, maybe it doesn't work well, maybe in different parts of the world, right. it may work. Absolutely. I, I agree 100%, yes. In this culture, I can tell you, Israel, it doesn't work well. But, you know, maybe in um, other country it does. Wonderful. So, guys, have a great rest of the day. See you guys next week.